Great, okay. Uh, good evening and welcome to scan.com's webinar series. Um, we're really excited this evening to have um, a very senior consultant, um, Mr. Paul Tricker, who's a knee specialist and works um, in London across a couple of hospitals. Um, he's going to be talking on the in injured knee. Um, and um, yeah, but before we introduce him and he kicks off, I'm just going to say a couple of things about scan.com. So uh, my name is Lizzie Tucky. I'm a clinician by background. I was a surgeon in my former life, um, but now I work for scan.com and scan is basically like the booking.com of the scanning world. Um, we can basically um, uh, offer you capacity uh, wherever you are, wherever your practice is, whether it's in central London or in the Outer Hebrides, we have scanning capacity and you can book in um, by uh, clicking on, uh, taking a picture of our QR code, uh, you can book in and refer a patient to us. Um, the benefits of scan is that your patient no longer has to do the admin of chasing the scanning center or booking an appointment. Everything is done online uh, and um, you can view the images directly through our portal. Um, and referring a patient is super simple. It takes about 30 seconds. Um, you All you need is basic patient information and a uh, really simple request and potentially a question. Um, you can refer the patient and then through our portal, you can actually track and follow up um, the patient, see where they are in their booking journey, and then you can review the reports and images in that. Uh, what you're seeing running through here is how you'd create that portal, um, and you can do that very simply via a website or by clicking on um, clicking on uh, or taking a picture of this QR code. Uh, it's, there's no charge for using our, our imaging, it's completely free and um, all of our uh, images come with a report and with clearly signposted next steps. So if you're a GP or a physio or a chiropractor who doesn't, who is comfortable ordering imaging, but doesn't really want to be responsible for what to do next, uh, all of the scans contain um, a, a report, a clinical report, which will enable you to make, to clearly define the next steps in the patient's pathway. Um, so if you need any more uh, information, um, please get in contact with us or uh, QR, do the QR code or send us an email. Um, I really hope that you enjoy the talk this evening. And without further to do, I'm going to hand over to Paul Tricker, who will be um, talking about the injured knee. So he's just going to share his screen, um, which might take a second, hopefully half a second, <laughs> half a second. Um, brilliant. Hi, Lizzie. Have you got the screen? Is that okay? Got the screen. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, welcome, everyone. And thanks for giving up your evening to join us this evening. Um, let me see if I can get my... There we go. So a little bit about me. I'm a orthopedic surgeon, but I deal only in knees now. Uh, um, and we're going to talk about the injured knee and the role of imaging, um, but also assessment, diagnosis, investigations and treatment. So that's what we're going to cover today, differential diagnosis of when you see an injured knee, uh, key things to look at in the assessment, what tests, x-rays, MRIs, ultrasounds, uh, bloods, uh, what the treatment discussions are, and a discussion around what's, what's new, what's hot, um, and what we should be doing for these different differentials. So my practice is mainly sports knee. I work in the NHS, where I have a paediatric knee practice as well. Um, I work in Surrey, showing clinic in London, and I obviously use scan.com. I think it's a very um, useful uh, addition to patients booking their scans um, up and down the country. Um, I also do knee replacements, I'm the clinical governance lead in my local hospital. Um, I enjoy training and I have an advisory role in certain insurance companies. So when I see a patient with the injured knee and I do run an acute knee clinic, both in the NHS and the private sector. So on a Monday, I have uh, the whole gamut of patients walking in. And these are things that are running through my mind when I see these guys. So has there been an injury? So obviously the injured knee, but people can have an acutely swollen knee. 
um, and these kind of patients present as well. And if they've had an injury, be it football or rugby or hockey over the weekend, or now we're still getting the, um, the, the, the residue of the ski injury, um, full stop. So we're seeing skis, ski injuries still uh, for the patients who are skiing in an Easter. Can they walk? Principally rules out a fracture. Can they straight leg raise? And was there any swelling? And if there isn't an injury to the knee, then you want to think about certain patterns, be it the degenerate knee that's got arthritis, whether people have patellofemoral pain or degenerative meniscal tear. But we're going to focus on the injured knee today. So when you see someone with an injured knee and an acutely swollen knee, so if you injure your knee, and it's acutely swollen. This is blood. We call that a, hemo, um, a heme arthrosis. Um, and the role, sorry, this, this, this question's come up right in front of my screen. Um, can I get rid of that? Um, sorry. So these are the these Sorry, things... just the flag, Paul. We will be doing a couple of um, polls while you're speaking. Okay, no I'll problem. Move I'll, I'll move them over. I'll move them around. Um, so blood in the knee, you need to exclude and think about these things. A fracture of the knee, can they walk? Can they wait there at all? An extensor mechanism disruption, i.e. when we talk about the extensor mechanism, we talk about the quads tendon, the patella tendon, or the patella itself. Those three things need to be functioning to lift the leg up in the air. Ligament rupture. So acute swelling following an injury is often a, a ligament and most likely the ACL. 65% of adolescents who injure their knee with blood in the knee will have an ACL rupture. That's a very high number, actually. Think about large meniscal tears, bucket handle meniscal tears, or a kneecap dislocation. They're the common causes of a heme arthrosis. The other medical condition that can cause acute swelling in the knee with blood is, I'll give you a second to think about that, but blood thinners, people on warfarin or clopidogrel or other drugs that can thin the blood, that can cause acute swelling and a hemarthrosis as well. Okay, what about this extensor mechanism? So as mentioned, you've got a patella tendon in the middle, the patella and the quads tendon, and all these three structures raise the leg in the, in the air and allow you to perform something called a straight leg raise. Okay, so that's the patella tendon where it inserts into the patella. The patella itself can fracture if you land on it. And the quads tendon can also rupture at the bottom. So a quads tendon rupture, no straight leg raise, very difficult to walk. These patients need to go to A&E. Obviously, if you can get an MRI scan and you're lucky to see patients that acutely, that, and you can get a scan that quickly, an MRI would also be very useful. A quads tendon rupture, the knee's full of blood, you can palpably feel a gap above the patella. There's a boggy, when you palpate that area, it feels boggy, it doesn't feel right. And the patella is palpably lower and on x-ray looks lower. And this is typically in the over 40s and often males. And patella tendon rupture, the opposite. A knee full of blood, you can feel a gap below the tendon. The patella sits higher, patella alta. You can compare these on both knees. And it's typically the under 40-year-old male that has these. So on this one, the patella is riding high. Okay, it's a patella tendon. This is an MRI scan. I was lucky to get one. The black structure here is a patella, and you can see it's come off the inferior pole of the patella and the patella has then gone up because it's unsupported. The quads is pulling this patella up. This is a very good, clear example of a patella tendon um, rupture. So no straight leg raise, not weight bearing, a and &E and X-ray or MRI scan. And then the, the third structure is the patella itself. And if the patella breaks and is, is no longer connected, then we often need to fix these to restore this extensor mechanism. Okay, so be careful with x-rays. You know, if you get x-rays like this, it shows a, a pretty innocuous patella fracture um, on two views, uh, relatively undisplaced. But if you get the third view, you can see 
the patella is pulled off at the bottom, and this is in fact a patella tendon avulsion which we had to fix. The early treatment is police, protect the knee, brace, support, crutches, load the knee appropriately, ice, compress, and elevate. Okay, then that's, that's the extensor mechanism. So what about meniscal tears? So there's a lot of debate on meniscal tears and what we should be doing with these. Okay, so oh, we, all meniscal tears don't need surgery, all meniscal tears should have no surgery. And in essence, I'm going to try and make this simple for you. Traumatic meniscal tears should be repaired. So if you go out tonight and you trip up on the anchor, uh, on, on the pavement and you lock your knee and you've got a bucket handle meniscal tear, then this should be repaired. And also they're associated with ACL and it's important to get the diagnosis. So this is the cross section of the meniscus, the top of the tibia and the red area shows which areas of the meniscus has a blood supply and if it has a blood supply it therefore is amenable to be sutured and repaired because the blood supply comes from the outside so the bigger the tear the more likely it is to be repairable yeah. tears like this are not going to have a blood supply right? these are little innocuous radial splits and these might do well with no surgery at all and leaving well alone, and it's not in the blood supply area. These tears, however, are big substantial tears of the meniscus. When this meniscus traps into the knee, like the picture on the right, um, on the top side, it's called a bucket handle meniscal tear. We need to pu push that meniscus back to where it came from and suture it up like the picture below and try and protect this meniscus. Um, Paul, we just had a question from the floor. Um, for traumatic meniscal tears, is there an age cutoff of when you wouldn't typically repair? Um, no, it depends on the patient and the quality of the knee. So if you have a 65-year-old knee, which is otherwise good, I, not much degeneration on the MRI scan, that's where the MRI scan is very helpful. It tells you about the rest of the knee. Then... That patient might be playing golf three times a week, might be active, might just be working, functioning, and have a good knee otherwise. And more importantly, they may live another 20 or 30 years. So the importance of big meniscal tears, and I'm going to touch on this in a little while, is that if you lose your meniscus, your risk of arthritis goes up significantly. So not an age cut off, uh, but more what the quality of the rest of the knee is like. But typically, as you get older, you're more likely to have degeneration. But if you have a locked knee, regardless of the age, then you need to have the knee unlocked, even if there's arthritis. Okay. And this is in contrast to degenerate meniscal tears. These are meniscal tears that happen, happen with age, happen with degeneration. They're slowly developing. They're not associated with clear history of trauma. And they're often incidental. Like if we go and scan, I don't know, 150, 60 year old people on the streets, many will have these incidental asymptomatic meniscal tears. And these are the ones that don't need surgery. So not a clear history of injury. Pain comes and goes. You can point to the joint line, be it on the inside or the outside. Occasionally they catch, give or lock. And if they do do that, then we may need to do surgery to help with those symptoms. Uh, and often I find that pain on squatting is a good test to see if someone's got a, uh, an unstable or more symptomatic meniscal tear. Effusion is swelling and often they can have quads wasting as well. A lot of discussion often of people say, oh, McMurray's test, I can't do it. It's quite easy. You can either get a patient to squat, which is a very straightforward way of doing it, um, or you can put your fingers on a joint line like this picture shows. Uh, internally rotate the knee, bend the knee fully, and then slowly externally rotate. And on the joint lines, on the fingers, you can feel or palpate and the patients are tender in that area. These are the Basque guidelines on who should have meniscal surgery, who should have arthroscopy. And in essence, 
it's what I've just said, traumatic tears or, or locked tears or surgery where you're going to consider repairing the meniscus, we should go ahead and do it. But if you're just going to go and do a meniscectomy, there is no urgency at all. This is a scan of a meniscal tear. So someone may give you a history, say this patient is 90, and I'm going to be deliberately controversial. Okay, and she has this meniscal tear. And she's had physiotherapy for a year. She's had painkillers. She's had an injection. And she has this tear. And this meniscus, this black structure here, has been squeezed out of the joint. It's in this inferior synovial recess. And what that means is it's trapped between the bone and the medial collateral ligament here. And when you press here, the patient hates it. And it's causing swelling on the bone of the tibia here. Now, I mention this because this will do well with keyhole surgery. We, we put a camera in the knee, we free up this fragment from being trapped and we remove it and the patient instantly feels better. It's like removing a um, stone from a shoe that you've just been trapped. So it's not an age limit. Lizzie, go on. Um, yeah, you've had another question. Why some degenerative meniscal tears are producing more pain than others? Okay, so good question. So it depends. The MRI will very much help you here on what the shape of that meniscal tear is. If it's an undisplaced meniscal tear, i.e. just splitting the tear, it shouldn't be too painful. It might be painful initially when you do it, but this will settle down like we talked about police initially in terms of protecting the knee. But with time, that will settle and it will become much more manageable. Other tears, which are displaceable or flap around, when the, when the flap is unstable and you're catching on it or when you're twisting on it, they can be much more painful. And when the flap is sitting where it should be, it might not be as painful. But there's no way. Yeah, go on. The second part, which is any specific types of genetic tears from your experience, which would be more symptomatic, which you were just saying. So, those. and those again, you've got time to treat non operatively. Let's see how they settle down. If they haven't got locking, catching, giving way, give them time, give them physiotherapy, rehab. And if things don't improve and they have one of these target meniscal lesions that talk about the target ones being ones that are amenable um, to surgical treatment or do well with surgical treatment, then we can do them. But those are the ones that we're often going to just trim or remove. And as I mentioned, there's no urgency to do that. And those are the ones that we should always treat non-operatively first. Sorry. Okay, so there are certain other tears now. So if you do get scans and you are able to get them, the reports may be featuring terms that you might not have heard of. Now, this is a root tear. And this means that the back of the meniscus has come off the bone. This is a meniscus here on the left, and it should be stuck down like the picture below it. And this is a meniscal root tear. And this is, these are quite bad, actually. They're often associated with ligament injuries. And that meniscus is, once it's come off the bone, it's like losing your entire meniscus. So in many cases, if that meniscus is unstable, i.e. is moving around, then you're going to lose that cushion in your knee. And these may need consideration to uh be stabilized and fixed again depending on the quality of the rest of the knee okay so not all meniscal root tears need surgery but a lot do and these are, need to be carefully considered mris are important here and so is a specialist knee surgeon opinion uh, they're called root tears and this other tear i'm going to focus on this medial meniscus here at the back it's called a ramp tear they're often associated with detachment of this meniscus from the back of the knee. So again, the whole of the back of the meniscus is loose or unstable. These are often associated with ACL tears. That's the term, the meniscus ramp lesion. And they're important because they cause increased laxity in the knee. And they're commoner, uh, much more common in ACL reconstructions. And it's important to consider whether these need to be sutured or repaired as this reduces instability. MRI can sometimes miss these, as can straightforward arthroscopy. Okay, so what's the big deal about the meniscus? Because if you lose your meniscus, you are much more likely to get osteoarthritis. If you lose the lateral meniscus, this is important information, you are much more likely to get damage in your knee earlier. 
if you're a professional athlete and you lose the lateral meniscus, that can be career ending depending on the sport you do. Okay, so the lateral meniscus in particular is very important and we should always try and repair rather than, rather than trim or remove this wherever possible. It's also important to not discount the medial meniscus. You know, if you have a young person or an active person who traumatically displaces a medial meniscus, they should be repaired as well. But lateral in particular, in terms of timing and the, the speed of developing osteoarthritis. So meniscus repair is important, particularly in the lateral side, the bucket handle tears, and these root and ramp tears, as discussed. So to summarize meniscus on one slide, on the left, you've got a new pair of shoes, you go out, you trip up, the, the heel comes off, you're going to get it fixed back. There's nothing wrong with the shoe. The, you need a good cobbler and you need to repair that. That's the traumatic meniscal tear. We need to suture that back. On the right, you've got a tatty pair of trainers and um, it's a shoe, it's got holes in it. There's a, there's a rip in it, but it's degenerate. The surface isn't good. There's no urgency here. You look after them trainers, do your DIY on them. You don't need an operation. There's nothing to repair here. And very, very occasionally if these flaps of tissue are really irritating the inside of the foot, you might go and do a meniscectomy, but they're not needed and there's no urgency and you do physiotherapy first and give these time to heal. That's meniscus in one slide. Okay, for me, if I'm a, an ACL and a 19 year old and I fix the meniscus on the lateral side, the meniscus repair becomes much more important if it's a big repair than the ACL because the meniscus can retail and you can re repair this, but the men once a meniscectomy has been performed, there are very few options left. Okay, let's have a little chat about the ACL. So we've done patellar dislocation, extensor mechanism. No, we haven't done patellar dislocation, we've done extensor mechanism, we've done meniscus. And this is the third cause the ACL. When you tear your ACL, people remember it forever. Clear history of trauma. I was skiing, I twisting, my skis um, didn't come off, my bindings didn't come off, I was playing netball, I jumped, I landed, my knee twisted, I had to leave the field, I was playing football, I twisted, often non-contact, um, can be contact, but often non-contact, pivoting, acute swelling, and they can't continue, and that's an ACL until proven otherwise. They may or may not hear the pop or tearing, so don't, don't, Hold out, hold out to hearing that. It's not the most important symptom or sign. The knee can buckle and give way um, and bindings didn't release, studs were fixed as mentioned. These need a, often end up in a &E or an acute clinic of some kind. And these are often x-ray to exclude a fracture, but they do need an MRI scan. And uh, this is a skateboarder who brings the video in. Okay. And this is the world we live in and nearly everything is uh, videoed and his knee goes into this position, we call it dynamic valgus, and um, he tears his ACL. Uh, this is a footballer, you're going to see in the yellow guy jumping up in the air, he lands, his right knee goes into valgus and he tears his ACL. And even very amateur games now are video. So luckily, sometimes the patients will bring in these videos and make the diagnosis for you. There's another one. This is a diagnosis. You do an anterior draw. Now, this is not an ACL. It's a PCL. But I just want to show the difference. This is why an anterior draw and posterior draw are important, because you can pick up the posterior sag of this uh, knee on the right. Okay, that's why I use the, this test not really for the ACL. The test I do use is a Lachman test, which is basically an anterior draw at 30 degrees. And this is an asleep 14-year-old uh, child I did an operation on as a positive anterior draw. And that's the positive Lachman test. And the, the pivot shift is gonna come now, which is an and I'll show you what that test is. This is where the tibia on the left is sitting in a forward position because the ACL is torn. And we basically perform a pivot of the knee and we reduce the tibia back. So for the surgeons or physiotherapists in the room or people who see patients acutely, it's a good test and it's, and it's pathognomic for the ACL. 
You can do this test when you're awake or when you're asleep. It's so easier when you're asleep, but you can also do it in an awake patient. And once you've got that test, you can tell the patient that torn their ACL. So if they torn a ligament, you want to refer them to a knee specialist regardless of whether they're going to have surgery or not so that we can discuss what's being torn in the knee. It's important they have an MRI scan to work out what other structures are torn in the knee. Um, and you can brace the knee. You can consider physiotherapy rehabilitation. And of course, you can consider surgery. So who gets surgery, who doesn't get surgery? So when I'm thinking about who a surgical candidate is for an ACL, I'm thinking about patient's age. I'm thinking about their sports. I'm thinking about whether they've got a high tibial slope. Again, you'll get that on the imaging because um, they're more likely to re-tear. People with hate hyperlaxity um, don't do well with non-operative non treatments. People have got the ACL plus a meniscal tear, plus a condyle tear, which is a surface damage, or they've had a rupture on the other side of the knee, or someone who's not going to cope with non-operative treatment. Most high-level athletes and most patients who want to. So I mentioned PCL. We discussed that posterior um, SAG, as the picture shows on the right there. And this is another test, which is the um, quad active test. You sit on the foot, you ask the patient to tense the quad, and the tibia goes backwards. That's the quad active test. That's a PCL test. Okay, now look at the yellow player here on the right leg. And then the left leg of the blue takes the right leg out. Okay, so think other structures, think posterior lateral corner. Again, the, the clinical examination here is a dial test. On the right foot, there's more external rotation than the left foot. For those who are doing this uh, test in practice, you should get someone to hold the knees together. So I put this picture up deliberately because the knees aren't being held together and you can artificially create a dial test. Okay, and if it, someone, a patient has a dial test, then it normally suggests a posterior lateral corner injury. Okay, so this is a dial test, the knees are together and the right knee has a posterior lateral corner injury. And you can see this because on the right foot, there's more external rotation. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you a two second warning. If you're having your dinner, you might switch away, for, uh, look away for two seconds. Okay, so this is the posterior lateral corner. It's an anatomy picture, I apologize. Okay, but there, there are some structures here. There's the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus muscle, and the popliteal fibular ligament. You will see these comments on an MRI report. Okay, therefore you need to know that they're in the lateral aspect of the knee and the posterior lateral corner. And these are important structures to provide rotational stability as I just suggested. Now, you also get rare conditions. This is the outside of a knee. This is the biceps tendon on this young man. And you can watch well, this yeah, you young try. man make his biceps snap up and down over the fibula head. Okay, this is where a dynamic ultrasound would be useful rather than a static MRI. But an MRI would be your first line to see the insertion of that biceps tendon. But having that dynamic ultrasound test would be useful to see what happens to that biceps as that patient does that. Okay, so another warning is uh, some anatomy coming up from the inside of your knee. I'll tell you when it's finished. This is a lateral structure, the posterior lateral corner coming up. Okay, so incision centered on the lateral epicondyle. Pull down here for me. We've got the ITB, the back of the ITB. Okay, and then we've got biceps. People often confuse this for the perineal nerve, or the common perineal nerve. I've just got some blood vessels. This is the head of the fibula. And if you go down below biceps, you can see the common perineal nerve and it curves all the way around. This is the fibula, round the head of the fibula and then goes through the perineus muscles. That's the common perineal nerve, dissected out and we're doing a posterior lateral corner reconstruction. Okay, so that's the posterior lateral corner. Uh, you've had a question, um, Paul. How soon after, sorry, it's a bit backwards, but how soon after injury does the ACL need to be repaired? 
Okay, so I'm going to pick you up on the words of the question. So repair means repair that meniscus, uh, repair that ACL back, and that's a we can maybe discuss that later in the discussion. Repair is a different question to reconstruction. So if you're going to repair the ACL, it should be fairly soon. That means we're going to try and keep the blood supply to that ACL. I do do ACL repairs in 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 younger patients, often my um, prepubescent children, actually, where I'm not going to strip the hamstrings or put donor grafts into them. Okay, so repair would be fairly acute. Reconstruction of the ACL, you wanna let the knee settle down, quieten down, get full extension. That can be a week or two in athletes who are doing you know, physiotherapy, icing their knee and getting the knee quiet, or it can take longer um, to let the knee settle down. The danger of doing ACL reconstructive surgery too acutely um, is that patients can stiffen up and get arthrofibrosis. Okay, so this is um, a quick few slides on lateral tenodesis, which seems to be very common nowadays. Um, I'll tell you who I do it in, but basically the principle for this is that ACL is a central structure and we're trying to avoid or regain, sorry, rotational control. So it makes sense that if you're putting something in the middle, that you might supplement it with something on the side to allow rotational control. There are a couple of uh, techniques that people use. One is called the lateral extraarticular tenodesis, an LET, which is where we use a strip of the iliotibial band to create, uh, to create a, a structure on the outside. And the other structure, the other operation people describe is an anterior lateral ligament reconstruction or an ALL, where we use a little bit of ITB or a little bit of uh, hamstring or donor tendon to create a structure on the outside. So that's an LET or an ALL. This is the procedure. You get a strip of iliotibial band. You tuck it under the LCL, which is this structure here. If you can see my arrow and you fix it on the proximal femur, uh, hopefully remote from your ACL fixation. And the reason we do this is it basically halves the re rupture rate in high risk individuals. And for that, uh, for those patients in my hands are young females, patients with hyperlaxity, patients with increased tibial slope um, and patients who are having revision procedures or big meniscal tears and patients who are going to go into highly explosive pivoting sports. Basically, anyone under 25 in my hands gets it and these patients in particular. There's, um, I'm thinking you're going to share these slides at some point with, uh, with, with everyone. So these are the one page handouts on, on these procedures if you are interested. Tibial slope is important, and so I mentioned it a few times. You can see it on imaging. Patients with high tibial slope, uh, an excessive tibial slope, as in, as in the picture on the top right, means that the, the tibia is much more amenable, likely to move forward, i.e. Uh, much more likely to put your anterior crucial ligament at risk. So patients with anterior tibial slope or high tibial slope, sorry, uh, would benefit from an LET. Okay, so... A little bit on rehab, there's good evidence to support accelerated rehab, which is a year or less, but much more based on um, com uh, completing activities and passing milestones rather than time. Uh, unrestricted and immediate range of movement, immediate weight bearing. I have no objection to my patients having open chain, uh, performing open chain exercises in the functional range between 90 and 45, and obviously early closed chain exercises. I know that doesn't, uh, the open chain in particular doesn't suit most, a lot of surgeons, but from my reading of the evidence and my, and my, and my practice, um, I'm happy for that to happen. Everyone who does ACL surgery should perform return to sport testing. It's important. And there's a strong psychological component to getting back to sport. And in fact, 10% of patients don't get back to sport because of the fear of getting re-injured. Um, I brace my patients if they've had chondral or meniscal surgery, but not just for ACL surgery. And if they've had a plateau fracture or significant chondral surgery, they're the ones I would limit weight bearing. So I don't tend to limit weight bearing for the other um, operations, but only if they've had surface damage to the knee. And that's where an unloader brace, I use that quite a lot, is helpful as well to allow weight bearing, but to unload the, the area I've fixed. 
So when you have a big meniscal repair or a condyle injury or a surface fracture, as I've mentioned before, the stakes are high, so take your time in rehabbing these patients to do it right. Um, this is just showing the difference between medial and lateral size. So if you have a lateral meniscal tear on the right, you're much more likely to uh, damage your meniscus, which is a structure in between uh, the thigh bone and shin bone here, the femur and the tibia. And so if I repair this meniscus at the back, if you, if you do a deep weighted squat, you're going to rip out my stitches. This is why I brace patients and limit weight bearing squats for up to four months in certain complex patients. This is a graph just showing that the ACL takes time. You know, so even if you're super quick and you think you're going to defy all odds, it's still going to take at least nine to 12 months for that ACL to heal you. So you are only going to race against yourself and you cannot win that battle. So if you want to go back very quickly to sports, and you can, but you cannot beat nature. It's going to take time to heal. Okay. I'm going to speed that slide up. And this one, these are possible. I want to talk about the fourth major structure. Um, fourth major diagnosis on a knee full of blood, and that is patellofemoral dislocation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to whiz through this. Okay. This was all over social media. Uh, an ACL tear. What's the tibia on this one, girl? Okay. Everyone said that was your ACL. It wasn't. If you had a view from the front, it was a patella dislocation. Okay. But everyone thought from one view, it was a ACL tear. Um, this is a patella dislocation. Typical young girls, they twist, the kneecap pops out. And if this happens, and if you're a physio on the pitch, the way to get this patella back is to lay the patient down, extend the knee, have them relaxed, obviously, and the knee will pop back. Okay, so who gets it? Young adults, it's quite common. If you dislocate your kneecap, your re rupture redislocation risk is about 15%. And if it happens again, your redislocation rate happens to go to about 50%. Look at the shape of the knees. When you look at these patients, they often have these squinting kneecaps. For the kneecaps to point forward, you have to externally rotate the foot, like the position picture on the right, a bit like Charlie Chaplin would have done, the way he used to walk to make his kneecaps face forward. There's these squinting kneecaps. They're often varus or valgus. They can be swollen. Okay. And when you examine them and they're back in, this is a J sign. You see the patella moves like a J as you extend the knee. It's often good to sit next to the patient and examine the knee like this. This is a, a young girl. I did an M MPFL stabilization of a kneecap on. And you can see on the right, you've eliminated the J sign. Apprehension is when you try and move these kneecaps to the side, the patients don't like it. They either scream, cry, or just move their leg like this. If they don't like it, there's a fear that their kneecaps are going to pop out. That's apprehension. Some patients who habitually dislocate their kneecaps do this. They come in, they go, yes, I can do this with my kneecap. And you can physically dislocate their kneecaps in clinic. They often have rotational problems. And... And these need careful consideration how we're going to stabilize these. It often doesn't hurt. They've been doing this a long time. And you can have these deep kneecaps dislocate like that and pop back like that. I mentioned valgus and alignment. And you can see when valgus happens like this, that the kneecap vectors are much more likely to push the patella laterally. So people are inherently anatomically more likely to um, dislocate their kneecaps. They often do this with their knees, particularly when they step down. There's rotational problems on the femur and the tibia, and these often need lots of supervised physiotherapy and for very resistant cases, often complex surgery. So often we talk about hyperlaxity. These are the tests you do for hyperlaxity. Little finger being um, hyperextending, thumb hitting the, the um, forearm, hyperextension of the elbow, and then also recovatum of the knees, hyperextension of the knees, and obviously can you touch your palms to the floor. This is a young man who came with a current dislocation of his kneecaps and has all these. He's the most hypermobile guy I've ever seen. He can do crazy things with his legs. 
like this and soft tissue procedures aren't often going and to benefit him. And do that. If you dislocate your kneecap and you have a fracture, these are often missed on x-rays and MRI scans are very useful indeed. I think MRI scans for all patellofemoral dislocations are useful and it's important because you can pick up big chondral fragments that aren't often seen on x-ray and these often need fixing back. Generally, if you dislocate your kneecap and you don't have fractures and you're not an elite athlete, first time treatments are often physiotherapy rehab and this is important to try and prevent a further dislocation. If it dislocates again, you might want to refer these and consider surgery. Okay, just going to run through a couple of procedures. Trochleoplasty is basically deepening of the trochlear, trochlear groove. If you think of the patella as an egg that sits in an egg cup, if the egg cup is shallow, the egg is going to fall off. Okay, that's the patella. You need a trochlear groove. Okay, and sometimes we have to create a trochlear groove. That's called trochleoplasty. Think of the egg in an egg cup or think of the bobsleigh in a track. If the track is flat or not grooved, the bobsleigh will come out. If you don't and the kneecap keeps popping out, eventually the kneecap will stop popping out and that's because the kneecap shell will break or the surface of the kneecap will crack and that's arthritis of the patellofemoral joint. So people often have patella alta. You'll see this on your scan report if you send the patient for a scan for patellofemoral dis uh, dislocation. It will mention, should mention, how high the patella is, because if the patella is high, it engages in the trochlear groove later, therefore it's more susceptible to dislocation. It will also tell you how shallow the, tro shallow the trochlear is. It will tell you if the MPFL, which is a major restraint, is torn or not. And what determines recurrence? If you are young or bilateral kneecap dislocators and you have a shallow trochlear, and a high patella, and you have something called a high TTTG distance, and you have patella tilt. These things are all measured on a scan, okay, often not measurable purely on an x-ray. And it will give you a good idea of how likely this patient is to uh, recurrently dislocate. And you can discuss this with, their pa with your patients as you decide what treatment options are going to be undertaken. So, in summary, treatments for patellar dislocation, MPFL, put a new ligament into the knee to stabilize the knee if the trochlea is relatively good or just shallow but not completely flat. If it is flat or dome shade, you can do a trochleoplasty and, and an MPFL. And if you have that abnormal rotation and patient's kneecaps are permanently out or are dislocating all the time, major surgery to derotate the femur and tibia. Um, can happen. This is quite a complex undertaking um, and very specialized, and that's called a derotation osteotomy. We're nearly finished. What about the non-injured knee? So if you if you do get these slides, this is a good a good picture to keep a hold of. What you want to think about: infection, arthritis, patellofemoral pain, degeneration, the red flags of tumor and gout. Um, and then other things in children, Osgood slatters, growing pains, uh, biomechanical, biomechanical issues, and don't forget about the spine or hip. In the child in particular, you can think about other things such as PBNS, juvenile arthritis, uh, metabolic rickets, um, yeah, and otherwise the same things as the adult. These are your red flags. The knee doesn't go straight or is locked. Fever, night pain, no straight leg raise because we talked about extensor mechanism. True locking means the knee physically does not move sometimes, cannot extend it. True giving way when your knee twists, it buckles, you don't have to hit the floor, but it gives way. And hemarthrosis, we talked about the, uh, the five causes being fracture or extensor mechanism, ACL injury, big meniscal tear, patellar dislocation, or those patients on anticoagulants. Okay, we're finished. This is my contact details. Um, this is how you can contact me on Instagram, so an e-surgeon. They're my secretary's details. If you're a therapist or a medic and you want to sit in 
either in clinic or theatre with me and then give my secretary a call. I tend to have a, a, a therapist or a, a colleague in, in clinic or theatre most days. Um, thank okay. you very much. That's the injured knee. Thank you very much, Mr. Tricker. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? That's fantastic, though, that people can... Um can come and observe you. So I would take that opportunity because it's quite rare. Um, but I think people have asked questions as they go. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback comments, but I think that might be it for questions. So um, just further housekeeping, we will be issuing certificates for attending this talk. And um, please get in contact with um, Mr. Tricker if you'd like to um, refer a patient or if you'd like to um, if you'd like to shadow him in clinic or theatre. Um, and um, and yeah, thank you very much for taking the time this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.